of the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to be here today. And Father, I pray a special blessing over all of the mothers that are here today. And Father, I pray that your spirit would lead me today as I deliver this message from your word. And Father, I pray that this message would bless those who hear it and that they would hear it and receive it with gladness and that they would apply it to their lives today. We love you so much and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today is Mother's Day. And for today's message, I would like to spend some time talking about the significance and the importance of motherhood. But before I do that, I do want to note that many of us come from various different backgrounds. And I understand that Mother's Day can be difficult for some. I know that some might not have their mothers with them anymore. I know that there might be some who are aspiring mothers. And I know that there are some that have mothers that will be mothers or that are raising future mothers. So I understand that as we come to celebrate and remember our mothers, that we all come from different places. And I wanted to make sure that we took time to understand that we all come and we all have mothers from different backgrounds. So for those of you who might be remembering your mothers today, remember God loves them and God loves you. And he is there to minister to you and to give you comfort and peace. I do want to spend some time to celebrate women and specifically mothers today because in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 to 2 it reminds us that we should honor our father and our mothers and I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do that where we can honor our mothers and in Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 to 28 we see that God has just finished creating mankind. And in doing so, he made man and woman. And he made both of them in his image. So we see that women are made in the image of God. So any of you women out there today, I want to remind you that you are an image bearer of the divine. And that you were made to be comparable to men as a helper, as a co-laborer, as a partner, as an equal. And you are given a great blessing that is in that text of Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, because it says to be fruitful and to multiply. So at the very beginning of creation, God had motherhood in mind. And he understood that through women, we would have a savior. But my key text today that I'd like us to go to is it going to be in the second epistle to Timothy. So second Timothy, if you'd like to turn there with me. It's going to be second Timothy chapter one, verses one to seven. I'm sorry, chapter one, verse one to seven. And this is a epistle written to Timothy from the Apostle Paul. And this is probably the final letter written by the Apostle Paul while he is in prison. And in this letter, he is discussing the fact that his end is near, that his time is coming. But he wanted to make sure that Timothy, who was his protege, his son in the faith, he wanted to make sure that he remembered a couple things. So I'd like to read this text for you all today. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, 
that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So Paul is writing to Timothy here, and he's reminding him of a couple important things. He's reminding him that he needs to continue to cultivate his faith, and he needs to stir up the gifts that God has given him. But he also wants to remind Timothy where he came from. And he points to his heritage. And he points to these two women who we don't really hear much from in the rest of Scripture. But it is interesting that in this text, Paul mentions Lois and Eunice. And he notes something significant about these two women. He points to the fact that these two women have the same genuine faith that is in Timothy. And that they are actually attributed to leading Timothy to Christ. And leading him to the faith and teaching him. And I think that we can learn a lot from women like Lois and Eunice. Because these two women were godly women. These women recognized the importance of sound doctrine. See, they didn't buy into the lie that women can't know theology, that women can't know the word of God or be able to teach sound doctrine. But we see here that these two women they understood the Jewish Bible, that they meditated on it, they lived the life, they taught sound doctrine, and they led Timothy to believe and to cultivate that faith in God. So these two women, they epitomize mothers of faith, how mothers can choose to make these decisions that may seem temporary in leading and teaching their children about God. But when they take the time to do this, it can result in an eternal reward. See, I think Timothy is very grateful for what his mother and his grandmother did because they were establishing a legacy, a legacy for Christ. They built on this foundation, and they understood that they weren't stopping with their own spiritual life. They recognized that they were called to move forward and teach the teachings of God from generation to generation. For generations to come is what these women understood. They were not going to cease in teaching and leading people to follow God. And this reminds me of my own personal family history in which my grandmother was a great person when it came to um, cultivating my faith. I remember that uh, she used to live in the Lake of Egypt area, and I would love to go, uh, any chance I had to go spend the night with her and hang out with her. And every single time that we would be traveling to the Lake of Egypt, I would always ask her to tell me about Jesus. And she would just go through all of the great Bible stories, teaching me about God and his goodness and his love and about Jesus and his sacrifice for me. And what I didn't realize at the time was that my grandma was looking at the generations to come. She knew that it was important to teach for the future and to remind those who were young how important it is to honor God. She was demonstrating what Lois and Eunice were doing with Timothy. She was saying, it is so important that you come to know this God that I worship. 
And I pray that one day you will make that personal choice for yourself and that you will choose to follow God. You see, mothers and grandmothers, they are instrumental in our development. I kind of like to think of mothers as the glue to the family. See, in my household, I think my mom was the strongest person. She uh, would always be able to keep our family together through the hardest of times. But she also was really good at um, speaking and translating how me and my dad would sometimes communicate. You know how uh, you can have two stubborn guys in the house sometimes. Well, she was really good at being the go-between and being able to um, communicate and to calm one of us down when we're going through these hard times. And sometimes I think that we don't give our mothers due credit on how important and essential they are for the family and for our development. Because I think mothers help us develop not only physically, though of course they do um, nurture us and they feed us and help us grow, but they're also there for us emotionally and spiritually. I know for my mom personally, she was the first person that I ever trusted, and she was the first person that I ever loved. She taught me what it was to understand the love of God. She was someone that loved me selflessly, sacrificially, and unconditionally. And if you knew me whenever I was younger, you would know that it might not be the easiest person to always love whenever you have a rotten little boy around and breaking things and getting into trouble. But she was still always there. Through my hard times, through my heartbreaks, she was always that person that hurt just as much as I did when she saw her little child upset. I also, as a little boy, and really today still, really like to ask the question, why, a lot. I like to know why things are the way they are, or why someone's thinking something, or why or how things do the things they do. And I can just remember time and time again where my mom would be in the kitchen cooking dinner, and I would just be standing right next to her, and I don't even know where I got all these questions from, but I would stand there with her, I feel like for the entirety of, the, of her cooking the meal, asking her a question after a question after a question. But she had that patience, and she just demonstrated that calming and patient, steadfast love, and always giving me a response giving me respect, taking the time to hear me, to listen to me, and to give me answers. And I'm telling you right now, I believe that my mom was a superhero because she just, did, she was relentless in her love for me. And I just would look at her and I just thought she just had all of the answers because anything that I had going on, she knew about it. And she was willing to give me some um, wisdom. But I think this is what happened when it come, came to Timothy's faith. He had some superhero moms, mom and grandma, and they were instrumental in his cultivation of his faith. Because it's interesting about Timothy is that he was a young pastor that did mission work with the Apostle Paul, and he actually ended up being one of the primary leaders and teachers at the church at Ephesus. And I think it's interesting about this is that he was relatively younger. But the Apostle Paul still entrusted him to teach, to lead, to shepherd. In Ephesus, when you look at these letters that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, he explains that there are going to be a lot of false teachers. And there are false teachers in the church. And he explains how important it is that he is keeping sound doctrine. And that he is protecting the gospel. And he's protecting the faith. And defending Christ. And it's just so cool to think that this young man had that faith that was able to endure. That faith that was able to protect and lead the church. And that the Apostle Paul trusted this man. And I can only think that this speaks to the foundations that was laid in this man's life. That he was taught by those special godly women. And I'd like to just read for you in 
uh, the book of Philippians, what the Apostle Paul, how he describes Timothy. It's going to be Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. In this text, we see... That the Apostle Paul says a few things about this man, Timothy. He says that there's no one like-minded. Meaning, if you're looking for someone that's as close to the mind and the thought and the actions of the Apostle Paul, look no further than Timothy. Timothy had the same heart, the same passion as the Apostle Paul. But then we also see that he did not seek his own. That he truly cared about people. If you're looking to have someone describe you, you would. It, it, the greatest thing you can have is someone describe you the way Paul describes Timothy here. Saying this is a guy that truly loves people. He loves to serve people, and he loves Jesus Christ. He has a heart for Christ, and it sh it says that he co-labored and was a son in the faith of Paul, and being a missionary for the gospel message. And it just points to then, in verse 22, that says, he has a proven character. So, Timothy had a proven character. He had a steadfast faith. And the Apostle Paul was very confident in this young Christian. And once again, I think this just points again to the fact that he was raised right. Because it's interesting, and we don't see in... The uh, letter to uh, Second Tim in Second Timothy that there's no father mentioned in the text, and I think we would all agree that fathers are very important. But for some reason, the father is not mentioned. And so, whenever I did some looking into Timothy's parents, I found in Acts chapter 16, verse one, that his father was actually a Greek. Now we don't know for certain if Timothy's father was a non-believer or not. But in the text of Acts 16.1, it does say that Eunice was a Jew and a believer, but his father was a Greek. So I think that it's possible that the text is implying that though his mother was a godly woman who had the faith, he had a father who didn't believe. But even if that's not the case, it seems to be very clear that Paul attributes the cultivation of his faith through these women. So it's possible that maybe Timothy's father died whenever he was very young, and maybe his mother was a widow. Either way, it just speaks to the strength and the faith of these women. That even when the father was not there to be that spiritual leader, these women took the task. They stepped up and they decided to be shepherds. Because mothers, you are shepherds for your children. And though I understand sometimes your children might get older and they might think that they know everything now, now that they're grown up, but you're really called to be a shepherd or an elder to your family all the days of your life. And I think that Timothy's gifts that Paul calls him to stir up and to practice and to apply to protect the church. These are gifts from God, but they are a result of his mother's shepherding. But I also want to point to the fact that mothers reveal the character of God. I think being a mother is honestly one of the greatest blessings that someone can have. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, they are in the image of God. But when it comes to motherhood, there's something very specific in which they get to reveal 
parts and attributes of God. See, when a mother is with child, they are partaking in creating and sustaining life. One of the greatest things that we attribute God to, the creator and the sustainer of life. But women get on some scale the opportunity to show this power of what God does on a greater scale. But we also see that with a mother, we see that they reveal the tender and the nurturing love of God. I know sometimes we think of God as a father, which he is. But it's interesting in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, when Jesus is lamenting over Jerusalem and how many of them have denied the prophets. He compares himself to a mother in this text. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have wished to gather you up as a mother hen gathers her chicks. That's how Christ looks at us. Christ has that tender, nurturing love in which he just wants to gather you, put you under his wing, protect you, hug you and love you. So the way that you have a mother in which who would hug you and comfort you and nurture you like that, that's what Christ is for his church. So Christ can demonstrate and show that type of love. And when we have a mother who represents God and does as Lois and Eunice do by being godly women and cultivating that strong, everlasting faith, when they show that love, they are showing Christ. And we also want to remember that God is your biggest fan. That doesn't mean that God supports everything that you do. But God looks at you and wants the absolute best for you. And I think that a mother is one of the best examples of what it looks like to have a biggest fan. When you see a mother who is dedicated to their children, you're seeing the character of God. See, my mother, she worked a full-time job from as long as I can remember. And I was in sports, every sport basically year-round. I was in multiple clubs, and I was in different um, plays and musicals. But even though my mom was in a full-time job, I cannot remember even one single event in which she did not attend. She was always there early. She was there helping me or assisting me in any way she could. And she was always that person that afterwards, she waited with me to the end. My mom was my biggest fan. And I just can't help but seeing the character of God in that. How there's this God who's with you wherever you go. There's this God who wants the best for you, who's there to help you, pick you up. And when it's all over, God is still there. God loves you. He looks to you. He's calling you to trust in him if you haven't already. And we should thank God for our mothers. And we should be thanking God for the revelation of his character that we can see through godly mothers. Because when we have the love of a mother, I think it points us to the gospel message. A loving mother would lay down her life for her children. And God did so for us by sending his one and only son, to die on the cross for our sins. So that if we turn from sin and we place our faith in him and we confess him as our Lord and our Savior, we will be saved. And it's interesting that we wouldn't have our Savior if it wasn't for Mary, who was a godly woman who trusted in the Lord. So I think mothers are very important when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our development, and when it comes to understanding who God is. And this will lead for our time of communion. 
if you have your communion and would like to partake with us today. So as I said, when it comes to the gospel message, we see how much our God loves us. And when we partake of communion today, we are remembering the broken body, which is represented here by the bread of Christ. And then we see that the cup represents his shed blood for our sins. That is the new covenant. So when we partake today, let us remember how great a love God has for us. How we think about God as our biggest fan, as the one who loves us tenderly and nurtures us. And whenever we're worried, whenever we're afraid, he puts his wing around us and we are safe there. We can have comfort and we can have peace. And that's what we celebrate in the gospel. Because of God, we are in a right relationship with him if we have trusted in him. And we have eternal life. And we have an inheritance, which is the kingdom of God. So let us say the Lord's Prayer together, and then you are free to partake. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. someone here today that has never truly trusted in Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and if you have heard how this Savior truly loves you unconditionally, he gave himself for you sacrificially, if you're someone that heard this message today, and if you would like to trust in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today, I'd like you to bow your heads with me once again and to say this prayer. God, I am a sinner. I am humbly seeking you today. I am asking that you would forgive me of all of my sins. I trust in you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he came and died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that on the third day, God raised him from the dead. I want to follow him today in obedience. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.